got everything loaded on a pallet here, ready to be loaded and taken to the machine shop. Flywheel, block, crankshaft, camshaft, and the head, along with the extra parts. And we're going to go in and we're going to talk to Barry about the necessary machine work that we need to do to this engine. Morning, Barry. Morning, Harvey. How's it going? Good. Got a project to work on today? Yeah, we got a 3010. We're rebuilding the engine on the 3010 that I've that I own, so got a well, few things to We'll get it out of the truck and take a look, see what you got. All right. Gonna do new cam bearings in this? Yeah, I want to do those, and uh, I want you to hot tank it, clean it up, inside and out. Okay. I think the block's pretty much okay, but uh, we'll go through the checks and make sure everything's okay. And we'll run a Magnaflux over it and okay. check that out, and we'll check the O-ring bores in the bottom. We'll check the top to make sure it's good and flat. Okay. If we need to, we can flatten it, but if not, it'll just be okay. We'll do that. How's our ring gear look on this? <laughs> Rusty, but it looks all to be there. So do we have a specification on height for this? I don't, do you? Yes, I do, I have a book that shows that. Okay, well let's clean this up and it seems to be pretty flat, a little bit of indentation, but uh, let's go ahead and Machine that back down. Okay, not a problem. Yeah, I probably should put that rag down so we don't damage the gear on it. Okay. What the bearings look like that came out of this motor? There was no catastrophic damage, just typical wear. Okay. Well, of course, we'll check it for size. Uh, journals look pretty good, doesn't look be any big gouges or anything in them, probably just polish up, but uh, we'll check it for size and go from there. Okay, I measured, you know, a little bit at the shop and it seems to be standard okay. dimensions, so. We'll clean it up and give it a good polish. Okay, you this, see this, this is a, was a fairly new Chev 350 crank, about 300 hours in a marine application. They got water in the bilge and a catastrophic failure on the number one crank throw. And then there's some debris from that failure went through the rest of the crank throws. That's something you're gonna be looking for. Should be fairly obvious. Okay, camshaft and a cylinder hand. Now I measured cam lift on this and, and the lift was okay, but... Yeah, there's, so. there's quite a bit of pitting in it, some uh, deterioration of the metal, some, some fatigue. So it looks like it's a good candidate to be reground. We can either replace it or regrind it, depends upon the economy of the okay. repair. So yeah, this lobe looks real good here, could be run. Uh, this lobe here, definitely uh, makes it so we need to do something to repair it. What would cause one to be okay and one to be pitting, is that? Um, could be load on that cylinder. Uh, looks like the oil was fairly good quality in it. Uh, must have something to do with the oiling of that because that's really the only one that's real bad, isn't it? Yeah. A little bit right on the edge of this one. Yeah, the uh, fuel pump lobe looks like it's worn considerably also. So we might take a look at the, the transfer pump, see if the arms wore out. Okay. Oh. Tired iron only brings the heavy stuff. <laughs> I've just done a preliminary check. I didn't see anything other than this pitting right here. Of course, everything needs to be, you know, resurfaced. But uh, I want to check it for cracks, magnaflux it. Okay. Um, 
pressure test it if you think that's a good idea? If, since we don't know much about it, we probably should pressure test it. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know of any water consumption problems, but uh, it was kind of an unknown. Okay. Do we have any broken bolts? Uh, exhaust manifolds look like they were sealing pretty good. Yep. So we don't need to do any special attention there. I measured measured the valve stems and the guides. Uh huh. Um, but I uh, only I only did it on a few select ones. They seem to be okay, but. Uh, have you check that for sure. Okay. If we need to replace guides, let's do it. We can do that. Um, there's a sending unit in here that uh, wasn't taken out properly, but uh, you can deal with that. Yep. Let's take a look at the valves and stuff, see if we need to get some parts ordered. I didn't bring an old. Uh, I didn't bring an old wrist pin. That's fine. Yeah, the valves are are pitted a little bit in the faces of them. Looks like the margins are getting fairly thin. Yeah, we should probably put some valves in it. Okay, I'll have you test the springs too for compression and and uh, okay whether they're straight. Yeah, looking at the stems of the valves, how much uh, galding and scoring's on them, the guides are probably suffering too. Okay. That's the one I did a quick surface on, it's yeah. pretty sharp. We'll need the thickness on the valves to get the height and the head correct anyway. Okay. Connecting rods don't look like there's any major failure, but we'll definitely check the big end for size and uh, put some new bushings in the small end. Okay. Well, sounds like a pretty good uh, project here. Uh, we need to fill out some paperwork and get, it, get a list of what you dropped off. Okay. So we don't lose anything. Sure. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, we'll get the camshaft sent off and get it ground and we'll get the other stuff in the cleaning machine. All right, thanks Barry. Thank you. See you Have tomorrow. Have a good day. Good morning, Barry. Good morning, Harvey. Ready to show us a little bit about how, what you do on these engines? Okay, uh, we've got the connecting rod set up to put some bushings in. Let's go over and do that. Okay. Getting ready to put the wrist pin bushings in, in the rods. And these rods here are pressure uh, lubricated. The oil comes from the crankshaft journal up through the hole here in the in the rod bearing up to the wrist pin bushing. So pressure lube right up through the rod comes out the hole here to, to lubricate the wrist pin bushing. When you put in a new bushing, it's important to know that uh, you got to get the hole lined up with the hole here in the bottom of the rod. If you do have a hole in the top, that is for oil to come down splash lubrication down to the wrist pin. These ones are pressure lubed. You want to have the oil hole in the bushing down. So we're pushing out the old uh, wrist pin bushing. Get it started about halfway out. We put some lubrication in the hole so it doesn't broach when it goes through. We line up the oil hole with the connecting rod in. Out with the old, in with the new. And there we go. 
Got the new uh, wrist pin bushing in. This is a new wrist pin. Almost fits in, but it'll need to be sized to fit the, the wrist pin bushing. Okay, what we're going to do here is we're going to torque the caps on so we can uh, check the big end for concentricity and size. Do we have a torque value, Harvey? 55 plus 90 degrees. 55 plus 90 degrees. Okay. We can do the 55 with this part. The 90 degrees, we're gonna have to have a little bit more leverage. Now, do they recommend putting new bolts on this on final assembly? Yes, and I've, I've got new bolts for it, so. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna do 90 degrees, which is a quarter turn. Okay, we're gonna set up the, the machine for the big end here. And these things, these are fairly big, so they need uh, some special, special ends in here. Now, the big end bore, we're gonna set the fixture. We set a micrometer with the measurement of three inches, 192. I always use the biggest number that they give you in the book for tolerance. Okay, we've got our fixture set. Okay, on the, on the dial here, we have between one and zero is what the tolerance is for the, the cap, for the big end diameter. And we just hit a hole, that was an oil hole, and we're within a couple ten thousandths in, in uh, diameter as far as being round, which is mighty fine for this bigger rod. This one's got some debris or something in it. It's got a, got a ding in here. We need to take a file to that. It's also got a couple little heck marks in there from the last person. And a little bit of a ridge right here where the cap joins the rod. And a little bit of a, a, little bit of a bump, a little bit of foreign material right there. So we need to take a look at that one and see what we need to do to fix it. Yeah, it looks like it's been working a little bit. In here on this side, there's a little shiny spot. So we'll just take a good flat file and take off the little burrs that are in there. And all we're doing here is we're not taking any material, we're just taking off the high spots. See, there's a, a big high spot right here on this corner, been dinged. So just enough to, to get rid of the high, high areas. If this doesn't make it come into round, we'll, we'll be rebuilding it. Oh, here's another thing that you tractor mechanics need to check. <clears throat> this rod is, has a bunch of mag magnetic force built up into it. See how the meter moves like a big magnet. I can stick it here and it'll almost, it'll almost hold on to it like a big magnet. Let's see if I have a screwdriver or something to hook onto it here. Yeah, not quite enough to do that. But this, this little meter here tells us that we have a magnet in our hand. And you, you don't want that to be inside your motor. So you need to demagnetize that. The way to do that is most shops have the ability to magnaflux your parts. You just take and pass the individual parts underneath a magnet.
and then see the meter, it still, it still moves. We'll have to pass it through a few more times. Sometimes you pass it one direction and then pass it back the other. Boy, this one's got lots of mag. What happens is this white, this yellow powder here is iron filings. So this thing will pick up all the iron filings when you're putting the motor together. You can keep it in your motor till it starts running and then deposit it in your oil. All right. Not a good situation. Not a good situation. Wow. Might have to go to my big Magnaflux table to get that out of there. That typically, though, that uh, that removes it. Just a few passes through. Right. There. Still pulling. Yeah, you can feel how that pulls. You definitely feel a magnetic force pulling that cap right on. How much is acceptable? I consider if you get it within one, the best thing is zero, but sometimes you can't achieve that. You just gotta kinda play with the magnetic field trying to get everything going the right direction. What, uh, what are the engine conditions that uh, cause that to occur in the first place? Uh, friction, uh, static electricity, the rotation, the rotation in the motor. Crankshaft inside the rod. Yeah. Guys welding on their tractors, things like that. So this, this one's ready to go back together and we can check it. Yeah, taking these burrs out did fix this, this rod. It's all within spec now. See, this rod looks like maybe uh, the crank had been burned up on this, this one before. That's Part a good looking crank, so it's very likely. Yeah. So that's what we'll attribute that magnetism to. Now this one, is this uh, What's it compared to the one we just demagnetized? This one has maybe another half. Another half, yeah. We should probably take them apart and demagnetize it. But we'll, we'll do the, the pin bushings first and then we'll okay. demagnetize them. About, That's not too bad. About one. Am I checking in the right places? Yep. We'll check in between here. I think it's almost two. It's three. Mo most magnets are like in the shape of a horseshoe, so you check at the, oh boy. Four, five, six. Okay, so we're working on a connecting rod pin of approximately inch and 500 diameter. So I have a chart here on my machine. Inch and 500 di diameter. It's a full floating wrist pin and it's pressure fed. So we want the clearance between the pin and the bushing to be nine ten thousandths to 11 ten thousandths of an inch. And we're gonna get a micrometer and set up the gauge. So we're gonna measure the pin. And the pin measures exactly inch and a half, inch and 500 or maybe two tenths below. So the book said inch and 501 is what we want the inside bore? Yep, inch and 501 to inch and 502. Okay, so we're gonna go for inch and 501. So it shows us we're about the same diameter as the pin. So we just need to make 11 tenths clearance. But 
what I'm doing here is I'm setting the riders so we have a six point stance on this. That way we can keep it round. I have a meter here that tells me how much material I'm taking out. We need to go about another thousandth of an inch. Exactly a thousandth clearance there, which is ten ten thousandths. Get all the grit out of it. The pin should slide right through. like that. Nice tight fit. You don't want them fit too tight. Then they'll push the clips out of the piston and then you'll have a big explosion. There is another way to do this. It's a little bit more crude, but the guy can do it in his, his uh, own shop if he has a set of adjustable reamers. You just have to sneak up on the, the clearance. You start just by taking a little bit of material out and then just work the adjustable reamer up. I'm not set up to do it. It's not the prefer preferred way, but I figured we'd give you another option. The object here is we're just polishing. We're not trying to put a new surface on it. We're just going to take and smooth out the few lines that it has in it uh, from dirt going through it. Uh, this is probably the best example on the main here. <laughs> uh, we try to choose the widest belt that we can to polish with, which I have in the machine, so that's what we'll use. What, uh, what, what grid of paper? Uh, this is 320 grit. Uh, the finer the better. This, this belt here is fairly wore out, so all it's going to do is polish. Just going to take off those burrs. We'll see what happens here. And usually what I do here is we'll, we'll turn the crankshaft on and have it spinning. You see I have it spinning fairly slow. And we'll land... I'll land the machine on here, go around exactly one revolution and then pull, pull my belt off. So you get, get in a rhythm and you do that, and that way you're not over polishing anything. Uh, you wanna keep it as even as you can. So the original spot we were looking at, I believe, is right here. And we have a couple little places left that wasn't, weren't polished out, but they're below the surface, so they're not going to make any real, real problem. But we got everything. It's quite a bit shinier, and there's no, no ridges to catch your finger on. We're not trying to make a, a new surface. We're just trying to make it serviceable again. Now we have some, some water damage right here in this fillet area, but it's not deep enough to give us any problem. So a stain of that nature will cause no, no problem with the bearing? No. The only time you're gonna have a problem with a stain like that is if you don't kill the rust, and the rust, you leave the tractor parked for, for an extended period of time without rust protection in it. it. The rust will grow and then it'll eat the bearing up. Is there a product that you use or just normal oil? Just normal oil. 
Yeah. Most oil has a anti-corrosion preservative in it. So yeah, we're pretty much ready to go here. Just the specifications on the crank need to be checked before assembly. Okay. But uh, I don't see any problems. So this process is done, just needs to be cleaned and ready for assembly. Well, we're gonna check with new valves here before we do anything, see where we're at. Everybody's got a Sharpie, I guess I'll put mine away. <laughs> we'll let Harvey be the Sharpie man. 25. 25 and 15 is 40. Need to move those to the next two cylinders. Seventeen. Forty-two. Forty-two. Twenty-five and sixteen. Forty-one. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Our exhausts aren't even close to being maxed out. When we grind these, we'll average probably five thousandths going down, but we're going to take in the middle of the head, we'll probably get that 5,000s back. So these are these are minimum specs? No, those are what's reported reported new. Oh. So I would say the the recession amount would probably be another 30 or 40,000s beyond that. Okay. So when these seats were put in, I don't think this originally had seats in it. When these I don't seats, think so either. yeah, when these seats were put in, they just haphazardly put them in there and they got them close. I mean, when we put seats in, you can kind of tell where they're generally supposed to be. But uh, they missed <clears> the exhaust by quite a bit. But they might have been measuring off of a off of a worn out valve too. Sure. Yeah, that'll make a difference. What's a, what's a worn out valve? give us for a number gives us 50 plus 12 so it gives us 62 which which puts us right in the right in the range mm -hmm. so by putting a new valve in there we get all the all the wear that they compensated with seats for back so we'll have to reset the seats we'll have to put new seats in we won't have to put new seats, we'll just cut the seats down in, in deeper and further. Okay. <clears throat> it looks like the material the seats are made out of is adequate. There's no major wear or anything in them. Okay. So I don't see any reason to put new seats in. We'll just machine these. So let's go over and Magnaflux this thing so we kind of know what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to take magnetic particle inspection. What we're doing here is we're using an electromagnet to make a field. And then we're using a yellow iron powder to check for cracks. And in between the two posts is where we're making the magnetic field. And it's always a good idea to check out on the outer parts of the combustion of the cylinder head as well as in the combustion chambers. Because sometimes we get uh, damage from uh, freeze crack and that usually doesn't show up in the cylinder. That's usually something external. And we, li we like to check all sides. And if we don't find any cracks, we'll find something that's cracked and show you what you're going to see. Uh, 
Well, we pronounce this one good. Let me find a head that's cracked here. Okay, there's a cylinder head that you really can't see, see a crack in, but there was a telltale uh, amount of seepage around it. A line there, that's, that is a crack in the top of the head. Nothing can be done with a cracked head or can, can repairs be made on? The economy of it is a uh, crack like that in our area can be repaired. It's kind of a dying art form. Um, but I'm very satisfied with my welding guy's repair on that. Um, you can buy a brand new casting for, let's say, $300 for this particular head. To weld it and do the machine work, you'll have about the same amount of money into it. So it's kind of a wash. But I mean, if the head wasn't available, then welding... Certainly an option. Yeah, certainly an option. Okay, this is an example of a welded cylinder head. Right here, there was a crack down this wall, and it's been welded in. They use what's called a furnace welding technique. They heat this head up to 1,200 degrees, so it's cherry red hot, and they weld this with a cast iron filler rod with oxygen and gas. Uh, what happens to the head when you heat it that, that hard? The flame hardening here goes away, so we have to put a seat insert in, and we'll set this up and do that. Okay, we reference off the valve guides, so obviously you'd put the new valve guides in before you do this process. So we use a simple bubble level here, level both directions. So that gets us set up there. And then we're putting in a valve seat that has a diameter of, oh, our favorite, inch and 13 sixteenths. Nope, inch and 687. So we get the appropriate cutter. Inch and 687 cutter. Have an air float table here, so Heavy objects are easy to move. We line our spindle up, then we set the cutter, set our depth gauge, and away we go. Now we have a valve pocket. The seat is only this wide and our step in here is probably a third again as wide so we need to take and narrow that so it'll flow better and we have a cutter for that. Not a lot of science here, you just go tell you get what you see you want. Then we need to take the filings out. Now I know how much press fit I have. I have between three and four thousandths press fit. You can make the seat go in a little bit easier by freezing it, but means that I know what my cutter's gonna do. We just take a driver and drive it right on in. There we go.
Now we have an unfinished seat in there. Since we beat on the head, we have to re-level it. I guarantee you the fixture isn't solid enough to take beating on it. So now, high tech. We're gonna take a three angle cutter on a pilot and cut the angle for the valve and then it'll be ready to just touch with a stone and, and run. So we take a valve and set our diameter where we want the top of the seat. And then we use this fixture to set our cutter. On this piece, we have the 45 is this little tiny tiny piece there, so we come in here with our piece and we move the cutter out to the 45. Okay, so we set the pointer right to the top of the angle. We've got a flat and this is pointing right to the top of the flat. So we'll put it in there and we'll cut the seat. So we got the head leveled again and our pilot goes right in the hole. Now, I'm not gonna set a stop or anything here. I'm just gonna go till I see the 45 develop. And then we would normally measure and see how much deeper we need to go. The 45 is just developing now. and the 30 just developed. So we'll take the chips off that. And that's what a roughed in seat looks like. Of course on the top of the cylinder head you'll want to measure how far the guide sticks out before you take them out. So this particular head, they stick out uh, 650 thousandths. You'll want to write that down because that's a pretty critical thing. We can press the guides in or we can knock them out by hand. It depends on how, how well they're lodged in there. have to have a driver that contacts the valve guide real well or the get, valve guide will get uh, split or swedged to a bigger size and then you'll end up breaking the head. And they're all the same part number in there? 28654? Yep. Okay, good. No mistakes if we all have the same part number. Make sure you put the put them in the right way, lube in the guide holes in the head. So we'll take a reamer of 374 size and ream the ream the guy. two guides ring. Valve slides good in them. Let's take and uh, grind a seat. Okay, we know the valve angle is 45 on this. 
that we'll pick uh, appropriate stone. Well, that takes care of the seat angle. We need to make another stone here to do a top angle on it, which would be at 30 or 15 degrees, whatever suits your fancy. A seating ring on the valve. We're a little bit low on it. Check where we are for height here and see what we need to do to fix that. So we're at 47, so we gain five thousandths. We can suffer with what we got. Uh, we're going to resurface this with a carbide mill. Um, this thing, we can vary speed and the type of finish that we have. A uh, simple level machine again. We bring, bring the cylinder head in and set it up level. I usually do a second check with the, the dial indicator on the machine, make sure it's straight. We're at zero on that end. If the head's warped, of course, it'll move around, but if it's zero on both ends and you got it set up properly, just like that, usually start out with a three or four thousandths cut. That way we can kind of see what the imperfections were in the cylinder head. That was a 2000s cut there, and you can see how we got all the way across the leading edge here, down this rail, and about halfway across this, this edge here. The next cut we'll take will be a 3000s cut, and that will probably get it pretty close. surface most of them because no matter how good they look they're usually out for five thousandths so this will be a total of about eight thousandths off this head a little bit worse than I anticipated Okay, we've taken eight thousandths off the cylinder head. We have a little bit of uh, rust pitting left in a couple cylinders, but I don't think that'll cause any problems. Uh, all the firing areas are, are good and clean. Um, just a few other stains in it, so I think we'll leave it at that. That way when we do put our valves in, we can set the heights and everything and be ready to go. Less two inches, so two and eight sixty-eight. Eight forty-four. Eight forty-four is where we needed to be, so we need to go twenty-four thousandths.
Well, I think the day's over, Harvey. Yeah, we got about all of it, didn't we? Yeah. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for bringing the work in. You bet, and uh, we'll see you next time. Well, uh, Quick yeah. question before we go. It's all right if people who are viewing this video send you their stuff? That would be great. Okay. We're here in Chehalis, Washington. Very good. Thanks.